Ray Lees. And George in the Jungle is back. <laughs> well, well done, George. Well done. I was um, asking for a, I was gonna ask for a last second shot of bourbon, but go ahead, start the intro. <laughs> well, that's where we're at. Um this show, as always, is brought to you by Remington Tavern. Remington Tavern can be found at 8892 Glendale Milford Road, 45140, where they had their daily happy hour from 3 to 7 p.m., $5 Woodford Wednesdays. Seems like George is already ready for his Woodford Wednesday on a Tuesday night. Uh, you can also find them on Instagram at Remy Tav Cincy. That's R-E-M-I-T-A-V Cincy with a Y. And follow them on Facebook. Goodness, maybe do I need to start doing no. a countdown for you, like in your in your no, news days? I, 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 thought I, just, I thought she would hear me, and I, I didn't even think about it until that thing started scrolling. It said five dollar Woodford, so I'm like, God, a little sidecar of bourbon would be good right now. So down I down at the I bottom of your screen, before, <laughs> I could get it out before you started and. Hit the button. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. But uh, down at the bottom waiting. of your at the bottom of your screen, there's a little there's a little microphone that says mute. You can click that, and then I can't hear whatever it is that you yell out as oh, that, we're. That's the one. Yep. That's the one. Okay. <laughs> In any case, Christ, she must have fallen asleep on the couch. How dare she? All right, I got this. This will work. Sorry about that. I screwed the whole thing up. But anyway, it's good to see you, Aaron. Yeah, good to see you, George. Um, so we will start at the fact that the Cincinnati Bearcats miss March Madness now for another year. Um, and they make the NIT once again. Your first thoughts as Cincinnati had their, their first Big 12 tournament experience and had to settle for an NIT bid as opposed to dancing in March. Yeah, the, the tournament was great. It was fun watching those games. Um, you know, it's all pretty darn good teams with some great teams mixed in. And, and then you follow all the way through that tournament and see what happened in that championship game. I don't know if you were expecting that. And I know seeing Iowa State firsthand at, at Fifth Third Arena against UC, how good that defense can be, and to see what they did to uh, Houston Saturday evening was, yeah. was unbelievable. I, I don't know that anyone could have beaten that Iowa State team on that day. Um, what a performance, and uh, drilling down the UC and missing the NCAA, we knew it was going to take a Hail Mary in that tournament to, uh, to get into the NCAA tournament. If they didn't win it, they were probably going to have to get that championship game. I'm not sure a win over Baylor was going to be enough. And they competed very well against Baylor. In fact, um, you know, I wish they could have taken a little more advantage in the beginning of that game than they did when Baylor was ice cold. And, you know, the Bearcats were controlling pretty much everything at that point. But offensive rebounding turned out to be the Achilles heel where Baylor ripped down, what, 14, 15 offensive boards, and you can't let that happen. But I, I think a lot of that, it felt like and there was there was a lot of that in the beginning of the game, but then when, when UC started losing their grip on the game, it started biting them again. And I don't want to make excuses. You just wonder how much of that is fatigue of third game in three days and you're playing a fresh team. And, and that's kind of what it felt like to me. Um, I give the Bearcats a lot of credit for battling the way they did in that game. I just wish they could have come out with the win. It would have made things a lot more interesting on Sunday. But, um, you know, all in all, a disappointment to be going to the NIT where we thought this team was at the beginning of the season. But when you look back and it's like, you know, you didn't have um, Bandago and Reynolds fully integrated in the non-conference and just things just kind of, I don't know. They're, they're, it was kind of, even though they lost two non-conference games, it was to Dayton and Xavier, um, you know, and the only other game of consequence in that non-conference schedule really was was Georgia Tech. Um, 
it just was kind of a clunky non-conference season for them where they're working in these players and getting their legs under them. And then, you know, they start in the Big 12 and, and get that win at BYU, and you think they could still make something special happen and make the tournament. So, yeah, I'm disappointed they're not in the NCAA. However, I am very proud of them, very proud of Wes Miller for embracing this NIT opportunity and not doing what some other teams have done. And I, I, I think – I don't know if you saw the Tom Crean comments, but he hit the head. So his message was, you've got five you've got five bench guys now. There's plenty of time for the portal and, and to investigate that and, and recruit that. There's plenty yep. of time for recruiting. You don't get a lot of time on the court with your players and you're coaching your players in meaningful games. And whether you think the NIT is meaningful or not, when guys go out there and they're ready to play on a court – against a team in another jersey, it's on. They're playing. They're competing. And Tom Crean's message was, you don't get enough time to do that. And he said that any coach that passes up that opportunity, he basically doesn't respect because you don't get enough time coaching games with your players. And as he said, even if some of your players are opting out, if you got to play with six, seven, five players that go out there and you'll coach them, then that's what you do. You play with what you have. If you got guys that just say, I'm not playing in this game in the NIT, it's not big enough, I'm going to declare for the draft, I'm going to the port, fine, go. You don't want to be there? You don't play. I will play with the guys who want to play. And what he said hit the nail on the head for me and is exactly – what I was thinking this weekend when I see all these teams saying we're not going to the NIT. And look, a lot of them have some valid reasons because they don't, they do have a mass exodus happening. But, you know, you, you look at Rick Patino, who three weeks ago said his team stinks and they're terrible. Then they're left out of the NCAA and then he's butt hurt over it. Well, you just said <laughs> you suck. And now your butt hurt because they didn't make the NCAA tournament. Get out of here. So you bring up the, the teams that did decline. Uh, those teams include Arizona State, California, Florida State, Indiana, Maryland, Memphis, Oklahoma, Ole Miss, Oregon State, Pitt, St. Bonnie's, St. John's, Stanford, Syracuse, UCLA, USC, and Washington. A yeah. lot of teams on that list. I, I think I, I, I'm just – I'm not in agreement with not playing those games. I, I, I'm just not. And I know, okay, there used to be the CBI. I don't know if that's still out there or not. That one I can understand if you don't play. Sure. If you're a coach or a player, you should want to play in it. But as a school, you're going to lose money. You may lose money in the NIT. I don't know. I, 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 I forget how all that works right now. But – if you have a chance to play home game in front of your crowd and get your guys out there in the uniform again, I don't know. I just know how I was when my sorry ass careers were winding down in baseball and, and <laughs> any other sport, I, you know, I, it's like, give me any opportunity to play another baseball game and I'm playing it, whether it's in a, you know, the, the tri-state league or the old Buckeye league, which were just beer leagues on, Sunday afternoon, um, I wanted to play another game. And I just can't imagine anyone that goes out there and competes and says, eh, you know, I'm done, I, I, you know. And, and look, some guys it does happen that way. But it, it, I'm just really, really happy that Wes and the team, and, and the question was asked today, will you have a full squad? Will every member of the team be taking part? And he said, yes. And that makes me feel really good about what's going on in Cincinnati right now. Yeah, and as these kind of echoed that in his presser, um, just that they're focused, hyper focused. Of course, there was some disappointment, um, but just that they were looking forward to playing more basketball together, and that they were hyper focused on that before getting to an off season. So, um, you know, and that it, it gets seems to what I like about what I'm seeing out of Wes Miller, because we do complain about some in-game stuff and all that, but the big picture culture 
is kind of a, a team, a family that wants to compete together and do, you know, just keep going as long as they can together right. and not let it go. And that's a good thing. And that may speak very well about uh, who sticks around this off season and comes back to help make a better run next year. I, I, I just, I, I respect the heck out of that. Uh, what I've seen here in the last week, the way they've come together and embrace this. And I think it, you know, you, 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 yes, you're disappointed playing in the NIT, but the bigger picture is that you can build something here. And, you know, Nick Saban talking last week about NIL and why he got out. And there was a lot of hullabaloo on both sides of that issue about him talking about him wanting to be a part of player development. He felt like he was losing that because guys were transferring out that didn't start and you didn't get a chance to take that freshman and sophomore backup and turn them into an NFL prospect as a junior and senior. And, and I get that. I, I, that worries me about this whole NIL thing, that guys who get into a pipeline like what, uh, you know, Cincinnati has here with, with Wes and this team, you develop these guys. They're, they're not the high-end five stars, but they could be a, a professional player by the time – they get through the program and progress year after year without jumping around and restarting over here and then restarting their career over here and then finishing up somewhere else. And then, well, this dates me, but then they're pumping gas a year later somewhere. Nobody pumps gas anymore, but the dry, unless I think New Jersey, they still have people pump your gas, right? Sure. I have no idea. I think New Jersey, that's still the law. The, the, I know the station attendant has to pump your gas. I know there used to be a, a station right there in Norwood um, that would pump your gas for you, but uh, I don't know. That's, Who did? Some place in Norwood used to do it for you. I'll tell you what. I I do miss those days unless I'm really really in a hurry. But it was kind of nice when they pumped your gas and then they would clean your windshield. If you need your oil checked, <laughs> they would do that. You know, I I kind of miss that, especially on a cold, rainy day. I'm before my time, George. Uh, in, in any case, Cincinnati has a game tomorrow night at nine o'clock against San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco coming in as a seven seed. What are you looking for as? this team prepares to take on a team that I I'm of the mindset that they should handle San Francisco easily, but stranger yeah. things have happened this season alone. I, I, yeah, I guess at home maybe easily, but I don't know that you handle anybody. I mean, they, their only losses were to teams basically in the NCAA tournament or in their conference. Who they lose to in the non-conference? It was like Grand Same. Canyon's in, uh, Boise's in. Um, oh, it's San Francisco, you mean? Yeah, San Francisco. They played some, uh, you know, they played some, uh, they, they didn't play a great schedule. But what I'm saying is they didn't have any really, really terrible losses that, that, were, that were blatantly brutal. Um, but yes, I expect since I handle business at home and you see battle tests in that big 12, um, I thought since I, outside of the, you know, a little bit there in that West Virginia game, but for the most part played well in the big 12 tournament. And I think you're still seeing a little bit of an improvement out of this team. And, and I, I, yes, I, I expect Cincinnati to win, um, San Francisco, that's only the second meeting with them, and that 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 first meeting is really interesting. Back in 1976, before your time, but I remember yep. that game. It was at the Cincinnati Gardens, and two highly ranked teams, and you know they're at the Cincinnati Garden, nationally televised. If you can believe that, 1976, that was a nationally televised game, and I can remember that game happening. And, and Cincinnati pulled it out. 
but that was a San Francisco team that had four NBA players on it ultimately. They were a young team. Bill Cartwright was on that team. Um, four NBA yeah. players, Cincinnati had a couple. And Cincinnati's team in 1976 was terrific. This would have been the 75-76 season, and Cincinnati had a great team, a uh, good young team. Uh, I can name them, but I won't go into it. But they eventually lost the first round of the NCAA. They won the Metro Conference Tournament, lost in the first round of the NCAA to Notre Dame. UC had the lead in the ball, trying to inbound it with eight seconds left under Notre Dame's basket, and they get called. Um Gary Kamsher tried to call timeout, and they said four seconds had already ticked off. So they got a five-second violation, turned it over to Notre Dame. Notre Dame misses a shot, gets the tip in, and wins the game by one. And I promptly dumped a rocking chair in my mom's house and went outside with a hatchet and tried to take down a tree with just this little hatchet. I was so mad. I'm telling you, if, if this were present day, my neighbors would have been calling probably the people to bring the little white coat, you know, and put me in the <laughs> because I thought I was going to take this tree down. I was so mad. And my mom just let me go. She's like, I just, you just do you and get it out of you. I go out and I'm chopping this tree with this hatchet. And I'm like, I'm going to bring this. I didn't get anything out of that tree before I finally gave up. Had blisters, but damn it, I was mad. That's about as mad as I've ever been after a UC basketball loss. That's that was a fantastic. So I wasn't. My brain wasn't fully developed, and maybe it's still not. But um, I, I was definitely upset at that loss. But that's the year. The only time they played San Francisco was that year, and I, I can still remember that game, and it was huge. They played at the gardens, not at the field house, moved it to the gardens, national game. And so it's going to be interesting to see the old Dons come in again. And not long after that game, Aaron, the Dons had a self-imposed death penalty. They shut their program down for three years because they could not get the alums to quit cheating and paying players. That was the wild, wild west. We talk about NIL now and all these things. When you go back to the 60s and stuff that was happening then and it carried over to the 70s and San Francisco could not get their program under control. And finally, the president said, if we have one more thing happen with a booster and money, we're shutting it down for three years. And of course, it happened. They couldn't help themselves. And so... This player got in trouble named Quentin Daly, and he got in trouble, and then he confessed that he took a no-show job for a 1000 bucks a month to go play for the Dons, and then that was it. Three years shut down, and they, they have not been the same since. In fact, this may be their best season since then, for all I know. You are a wealth of information. Yeah, Bill Russell played for San Francisco, Casey Jones – those were two Celtic greats that, that you know, obviously the Celtics dominated the NBA. The Royals would have, Cincinnati Royals would have if it hadn't been for the Celtics back then. But the Royals were a damn good team in the Eastern Conference. But but they couldn't get through Bill Russell and those guys. It was, uh, it was something else. Something else. But, yeah, that's I'm my still- San Francisco. That's why, like – I'm really looking forward to this game tomorrow night to see the Dons. I haven't seen them since 1976. I, I'm still picturing a young George Vogel just using a, a hatchet to try and fell a tree. That was dumb. That was so <laughs> dumb. That was so dumb. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you learn the hard way. And when I you're feel a like- teenager and these hormones are raging and you don't know what you're doing, you learn the hard way, and I learned the hard way. That day. I feel like most of your lessons have been the hard way, George. Yeah, there it is, San Fran, two national championships in the 50s. And then that was probably right right around or right before the Oscar era. And then UC got a couple national championships in a row, and it should have been three. And who do they lose to? Loyola of Chicago 
in overtime in 1963 who they could see in the second round of this tournament. Unreal. A lot of history in this tournament, man. A lot of history. Yeah. That all said. <laughs> I uh, just threw you for a loop. You, you really did. I did not expect any of those things. <laughs> um, that all said, on the, on the flip side, uh, the women's team also makes the NIT, yep. and they will they will also be playing in March, as uh, Katrina Merriweather, Coach Katrina, will be leading her Lady Cats against uh, the winner of Eastern Kentucky at Purdue Fort Wayne. Um, there is no time or I have no. Th there's very little detail as to when they will be playing at this point. Um, everything's TBA from what i'm seeing on the women's nit website so hopefully they get the support she's done a great job in year one and and seems to have things trending in the right direction and uh i would love to see uc have a good women's program i, I would love to see it take off yeah the uh lady bearcats finished uh, what it was it 14 and 17 overall, uh, five and 13 in conference play because let's face it, the Big 12 is it's tough. It's so, loaded. Uh, that does not change as you look over at the women's side of things, but um, both teams playing in March, playing for something. Um, take this over the the CBI and the CIT any day. Um, yes, and so, I, somebody said, yeah, right? it was who was it said. That that CBI is still around, which I wasn't sure. I should, yeah, Jeffrey M and CBI and CIT still exist. I remember when UC went to the CBI, it was one of Mick's first years, and I was in Washington. And, and of all people, you know, of course, Bob Huggins had that. I went to Washington, Xavier was playing there in the NCAA tournament, and I went to cover them, and West Virginia was there too, and Hugs was coaching them. And he was just giving me the business about being in the CBI and why wasn't I covering that? And oh, he killed me. He's so funny, so damn funny. Well, uh, we we did find out earlier that that Mick and UCLA did turn down the NIT. So, yeah, I, I don't I don't know what's going on there. That's not like him. Um, I don't know what the hell is going on there. Times of times of change for Mick Cronin. Uh, Mick accepting will, the, I mean, accepting the CBI with UC and, and not accepting the coach a, UCLA. Yeah, I mean, he would coach a West Side Junior Pro team this weekend if he could. That's <laughs> that's very strange to me. But maybe maybe not, that's why he, maybe that's why he couldn't do it. He actually is in fact coaching a West Side well, Junior. And and I, I I hate to say this, but I will. Um, like that whole UCLA basketball are a thing. And I don't know when they've been in the NIT and played in it or if uh, but let's just say, and I'm not saying Mick says this, but it's the people around the program and the, you know, the Bill Waltons of the world still think it's 1968 and UCLA is the SHIT. That, that's yeah. changed. And that's they still Bill think all you got to do is say UCLA and any kid in the country from anywhere will want to go there, and they don't get it. That's because Bill Walton has been on a Grateful Dead acid trip since 1968. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, um, he didn't get any of that, like, knockoff stuff. He got the pure stuff. I, I did want to bring up, as we're kind of wrapping up our conversation on the Cincinnati Bearcats, um, it was announced this week that Grippo's – is in some type of agreement that I am a little fuzzy, and maybe you know a little bit more than I do on this, but do you know what I'm talking about here? No, you're cold cocking me on this one. But okay, so, so apparently they are changing the label of the barbecue chip to the Cincinnati Bearcats barbecue chips. Really? And this is a partnership with, with Cincy Reigns. Oh, I saw this. Huge saw this on Twitter, but I'm not sure. And this is where I'm a little fuzzy. I'm not sure. If it's real? A, I'm not sure if it's a different barbecue flavor. Yes. It was put out by um, the guy who's in charge of Cincinnati's uh, marketing. Okay. Um, 
so this was not, oh, and it wasn't a, not April first or anything. So I'm not sure if it's the same barbecue flavor or if it's a, a different new barbecue flavor. I, I I'm it finding it hard to believe that they would be ponying up on every bag of barbecue chip that they sell. Right. What? Yeah. Just. Uh, I'm I'm curious to see how that it evolves um, because that's a that's a huge deal if it is in that fact is a the huge deal the original. Was, and, I mean, man, you even know if it's that is even if it's so many cents per bag. I mean, that's regardless, right. whatever it is, it's I it's it's a late uh, to me. It's it's a it should have been probably the the pilot for Grippos and NIL as opposed to the Marvin Harrison thing. I was left a little little jaded by Grippos when they had Marvin Harrison on a bag of chips, as opposed to anybody in Cincinnati. But I, I think this is a, a nice little uh, makeup. Totally. You will. Nice makeup. It's like when the, uh, remember when, when uh, graders had the Buckeye thing and people yeah. were, and then they had the boldly Bearcat. And by yeah. the way, the Boldly Bearcat came out again not too long ago. It's new and improved. There's something up. It's changed a little bit. And it is so good now, that ice cream. that And I can't find it now. i got to go to a <laughs> greater store probably to get it. Well, but the it, original had the red velvet. Hmm? The, orig the original had the red velvet Oreos, and now they've gone to just the regular Oreos because Oreo discontinued the red velvet Oreos. Okay, so these are th this makes it better. I, it's this fantastic. So damn I, good. I love Boldly Bearcat. I mean, I have, yeah. I It was okay before, but now it's fantastic. It's a, I'm glad they took those velvet ones and got rid of them and, and did the right <laughs> These, I couldn't put this crap down. I mean, I'd be as big as Trent Brown if I would have kept eating that. I mean, if I'd had enough to eat because I couldn't, I couldn't put it down. So... That's interesting. So all these things are coming together, and uh, well, I, I'll be yeah. on the lookout for those uh, grippos. And I, I only bring that up as uh, Randy here was asking about nil money earlier in the yeah. show, um, which is a great question, and I wish I had an answer. I'm going to safely assume that just with Kentucky and Ohio State being as blue as their blood is, uh, I, I would safely assume that they they have money hand over fist from a program like Cincinnati in all the sports. Yeah, and you look and and you look at Kentucky, okay? Let's just take that. Outside of Louisville, where Louisville's got their own little fiefdom down there where where there's no pro sports, there's minor league sports and all that. But Cincinnati's such a hard nut to crack because you got Bengals, you got Reds, you got FC Cincinnati. Now. Then you've got all the college pro. It's just all the marketing dollars in Louisville pretty much go to U of L stuff first, and then it'll go to the bats and the soccer team, and, and and the whole state of Kentucky is like that for the Big Blue, and it's just not like that here, and that's definitely a concern. Um, what helps offset it is we've got so many great corporations in town, and if if they get behind it and pull their weight behind it, um, Cincinnati will be fine. But it's been, look, we're way ahead of where we were back in 1976 when the Paracats had a nationally ranked basketball program, but football wasn't even on the map. And actually, 76, they had a pretty good football team. But there were no resources for football. So University of Cincinnati has come a long way financially in the local landscape. Um, hopefully they can keep pushing forward and, and get more and more of those marketing dollars, but it's such a different deal. And even Columbus, Columbus has what the blue jackets. Yep. And, and the, uh, and the, and the and crew, they got the crew, but it's, 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 it's a little different than Cincinnati. And I hate to say this, but we are so fractured here with the colleges too. I mean, you got Kentucky, Ohio State, you know, Cincinnati, the team in Norwood. Um, 
you've got Miami, you've got Ohio University, you've got Dayton, you've got Indiana, you've got Notre Dame fans here. It's just so fragmented, but it's it's gotten a lot better. And in my lifetime, from where it started, when you could walk into a UC football game in the second quarter with a student pass and sit anywhere you wanted to sit in that stadium, that's what it was when I went there. And now to see what it is now, it's come a long, long way. And it's taken a lot of work by a lot of people, but by golly, they're a hell of a lot further along than they were. And they're much better positioned now for what's coming down the road than what they had been. Um, I, I think the hard work's over. There's your, oh, no, there's your, that's barbecue. Excited. That's the, that's the tweet from chips. That's the tweet from Martin Ludwig. So, uh, and, and Grippo reposted it. So I don't, I'm not, I'm not crazy. A box. <laughs> I'll, I'll be buying those by the box. Uh, yeah, Martin Ludwig is in charge of uh, the the university's uh, marketing and all of that, and makes the final call on all their marketing and use of. The well, they've done a the good C-Pro. job. You got, you know, you got these things going on, and this Grippo thing so, now. It should be it should be good for the program. Uh, switching gears, you bring up Trent Brown. As he becomes you know, the I'm newest, of the ones I could think of, and this guy's a mammoth. He is that. Uh, he becomes your newest Cincinnati Bengal, as the Bengals have now anchored both tackles with six eight giant humans, both with the last name Browns, on a team owned by Mike Brown, son of Paul Brown, as they play the Browns twice a year. By the way, they'll also be blocking for a running back named Chase Brown. <laughs> yeah, there's Brown behind Brown or Brown against the Browns. That can happen. <laughs> what can Brown do for you? Or, or... Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I, I do. I mean, this signing's a no brainer, right? Yeah. It's a one year deal. Yeah. You know, you still might grab a tackle in the first round, depends, but you got sure. flexibility now. Well, it also. You don't necessarily have to. It, it opens up the board quite a bit more. Um, yep. But it, it improves your tackle situation. I think he's a better tackle than Jonah Williams. Uh, he's probably more um, more meant for this system than Jonah Williams. Mm-hmm. Um, and whatever you can do, th- this team is showing they're they're waiting. They're they're patient, far more patient than I would be in this situation. Um, with all of their signings thus far, they have not overspent anywhere. They're being heralded by many talking heads as having the best offseason of anyone in the NFL at this point. I mean, you look at what Cleveland did. They brought in Jerry Judy, who's never had a thousand year season, and they just paid him, what, I think, $59 million for three, three right, seasons. Right. That's all upside. That is all. And, and sometimes upside never happens. Correct. Um, so I don't know. And you look at you look at the Steelers. They're in panic mode at this point. I think it's safe to say. As you trade away Kenny Pickett, you bring in Russ Wilson. You bring in Justin Fields. Fields' move was a good move by them. Well, outside Everybody of Dr- Russell's the starter and all. I ain't so sure. Outside I'm not of so sure. Outside of C.J. Stroud, I'm still holding my breath, waiting to see an Ohio State quarterback worth a shit. I don't give Joe Burrow that I Ohio State. saying, but over what the Steelers have had, I think Justin Fields might be an upgrade, and I think in the right situation, there's still a chance. I, I'm not writing him off, and I'm not saying um, – I'm not convinced that the Steelers are sitting there right now, and they may be saying this, Russell Wilson, you're our starter. Ah, uh, I'm telling you, I I think I think Justin Fields might be winning that job. Until Mike Tomlin's gone, the Steelers are always a problem. Uh, so right. it just simply is what it is at this point. Um, but this this division continues to get harder for everyone, literally yeah. everyone. 
Yeah, um, no, I mean, you know, the Bengals go out and 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 grab Geno Stone from the Ravens. The Steelers take Patrick Quinn from the Ravens. Um, it it just it, it's a crazy division. It's a good division. Um, but I I really like what the Bengals have done. And it wasn't all that long ago that you would be laughed at if you said the Bengals were shrewd. But they've been very shrewd over the past several years. And, you know, you, you go back to that Hendrickson signing, free agent signing. Yeah. And, you know, they blasted right through and got him on day one. And people are like, oh, they overpaid. The only reason he was any good was the guy on the other side. No, that guy's been a gold mine for the Bengals. Maybe and the they, other guy on the other side of moves. Yeah, maybe the other guy on the other side of Hendrickson is the reason Hendrickson – like Hendrickson is the reason he was good because exactly, exactly. Goodness. It was, um, it, it, and and it's just uh, it's a whole new ball game for them. Although it's been going on for about four or five years now, but it, it's it's definitely still for an old guy like me who remembers when the Bengals would sit there through free agency and sign no one and do nothing until it was you know all the the bargain basement shopping the blue light specials and it was the guys that nobody else wanted well they're grabbing guys a lot of people want and they're and they've been smart about it and they're not spending themselves into oblivion and you know they have to line themselves up to resign chase but um they're doing that it, it's it's i mean i i, I love it I just, it's, I love smart organizations and they've been very smart. Running through the list of Bengals that are the, the list of free agents uh, that the Bengals have made moves with. They re sign offensive lineman Cody Ford. They re sign running back Travion Williams. They re sign tight end Tanner Hudson. They re sign today, uh, I believe it was today, wide receiver Trenton Irwin. Uh, they re-sign linebacker Akeem Davis Gaither. They sign free agent Mike Jasicki, tight end. They re-sign tight end Drew Sample. They bring in running back Zach Moss. They bring back safety Von Bell. They bring in uh, interior defensive lineman Sheldon Rankins. They bring in offensive tackle Trent Brown. They bring in free safety Geno Stone. And they put the franchise tag on T. Higgins. I, I love everything they've done. You want to trade T, though. I still want to trade T, and I think it needs – if you're going to trade T, it needs to be done before the draft because that's where the, the stock is. Otherwise, um, if, you, if you don't trade T this season, you're, you're potentially looking at franchise tagging him again next year to trade him next offseason. Right, and and I I, I will say this. I get what you're saying, and I understand. And, and from a value standpoint and what they get back in value, you are correct. However, I think they're looking at this as we can win the whole ball of wax this year. If we keep nine upright in the pocket, there's nobody we can't beat. Well, you uh, just wonder – I guess you just wonder how much is T. Higgins at the advice of his agent going to be giving you if he's on a one-year – more or less a one-year prove-it deal. Yes, and that's that's where the Bengals have to be sure that they know T. Higgins, that this is a kid that when training camp is over and we line up for real, he's going to be giving his all every game. And if they are comfortable with that, you roll with it and you try to win it all this year. And that's where Zach Taylor and his coaching staff and, and and Duke Tobin, all those guys have to be sure that he's the guy they think he is and they're not going to be dealing with any of that other guff, that he's going to go out there and try to win the damn Super Bowl too. I think he will. I'm a little naive and I'm a little gullible, but I think he will. I think anyone who goes out on that field and has a chance to win a ring, you're going to want to win a ring. I love that you bring up Zach Taylor uh, because that brings me to my next point. As you had Sheldon Rankins talking in his presser this week about how just 
joking with Zach Taylor when he signed, you know, why didn't you slide to me when, when they were playing the Houston Texans? Um, Might have been the see, funniest thing I read all week. You can see just how he's already gelling with Zach Taylor. Um, <laughs> Apparently, Zach Taylor told Trent Brown today or yesterday, you're the missing piece. And, you know, just kind of already just making his presence known as head coach, just kind of saying the right things, doing the right things to get a guy that probably is a giant missing piece, no pun intended. Um, but, you know, just I love what he's doing. And then you see um, Harris already in the working out today when Trent Brown was there visiting or yesterday. And, and he was just impressed that, you know, here it is March. I think it was today, uh, March 19th. And Karras is already in getting a workout in this team is clearly wants to win. They're, they're not messing around this off season. Yeah. Ted's the man. Ted, Ted is so good. And that was such a great signing too. Um, you know, he's kind of the leader kind of in that locker room in a way, certainly, uh, you know, you think about Burrow and all that, but Ted's like kind of the rock, um, been around the block a little bit and, um, just a multifaceted guy who can talk about anything, just, um, you know, does that community work, which, you know, he's been recognized for justifiably. So, um, so I, I, yeah, the, the, the whole culture down there is really, really good right now. And you got a Von Bell coming back who, it was fun reading that part where before he came to Cincinnati to do the deal, he got in a 5 a.m. workout in Miami and then gets on the plane. And come, it's like, who does that? So like if you were signing another multi-million dollar deal or whatever somewhere, are you going to get up? At, at four and then go work out somewhere and then jump the plane and go, are you just going to get up and have a couple McMuffins and get on the plane? Well, I don't and think I can answer that because we, we, we do things differently. Me and Von <laughs> Bell. That's, that's not a fair question. No, it's probably not, but it's just so like crazy that he's that regimented. And, and look, he totally fits Von Bell, what the Bengals do. And he knows yep. his defense and what Lou wants to do inside now. It's terrific that he's coming back and what they have. And I expect a much improved uh, defensive backfield play this year, I especially agree. the safeties, because that hurt them for a while last year until they started figuring it out. But even then, it was too late. Um, so, I, I, yeah, they're having a great offseason. And uh, – it's great that they keep identifying these guys and and the majority of them are hardworking football nuts who want to win. And that's how you win. Well, and how much better does that make Dex Hill? Does that make battle having it oh. having a guy who knows oh. how to communicate on the field? Jordan at, Battle's at a, gonna love this guy. At the safety position, he even if he's only here for one year, mm -hmm. which by 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 the way, uh, Carolina is still paying him six million as he comes here on a vet minimum, like one point five million dollar deal. Right. Um, so that's so I think they pay the it's difference. A great deal, but absolutely. Um, but yeah, Jordan Battle and Dax Hill getting to learn from him, even if it's just for a season, and getting to take the tutelage and apply it in this defense. If Dax Hill can't figure it out, he's a free agent next year anyway. You part ways, everyone goes about their life, and and right, no no harm, no foul. Uh, but if it does work, if it does, you, you obviously parted ways with Nick Scott. He wasn't getting it. Um, we saw plenty of that last season. Uh, but it also allows Dax Hill now. If you really wanted to get exotic with your defense, you could kind of put Dax Hill in that that spot where you're playing between a safety and a cornerback as he plays both positions right. um and you can kind of do like like a, a not to take the bearcats lingo but you can almost have that star position where right. he's playing between in a in a hybrid type role and who knows what kind of stuff we'll see out of a defense now where you get a captain back like von bell 
Yeah, and and that's you know, it's perfect for the Bengals to have that situation, and that's why they get those kind of guys, man, for that very reason. And 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 Dax Hill could play. You know, Lou's going to have a field day with that. He's going to love having this little piece. He can move around here and there, and it 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 could be interesting. It could be exotic. It's I saw. I don't know why I just saw this comment. This Craig James when he was drafted by the Patriots out of SMU claimed he took a pay cut. Oh my God, that's funny. If you remember SMU, did you ever see the Pony Express thirty for thirty? I did not. If you get a chance, view it. It okay. is probably, I would say, top three out of those that I've seen. It oh, was wow. amazing. It was amazing. And I lived through that era when SMU, you know, was kicking butt on the football field and these boosters. It was like I was talking about San Francisco earlier. This, you know, the school president's like, we're not cheating anymore. And then he turns around and finds out. It's like, well, Mr. President, if we don't pay these players what we said we would pay them, we're going to get turned into the NCAA. All right, <laughs> pay the players. <laughs> and got the death penalty. It's an amazing story. Amazing. Well, reeling you back in, um, back to the Bengals talk yeah, here. Sorry. I just That's saw a comment. I'm like, oh my god! I I guess as we are approaching the the lull of free agency and and getting ever closer to the draft, rumors flying around as to what Cincinnati is going to draft. All of that. I don't want to ask who you think we're going to draft because I, who knows who's going to be there at pick 18 and where they currently stand. Um, I'm more curious as to what positions you think are still light where where do you think that they need to be focused in on as they either look around who's available between now and, and the draft look around at the draft of positions of need not necessarily with the first round pick but throughout the draft where you need to address well i i would say still like corner tackle um and you know what? I, I don't think in the first round you do this. It depends on what you're thinking about, T. But there's going to be a wide receiver somewhere, right? I think we would have to, yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be that somewhere. Um, you know, I, I don't think, given the way they're built right now, you're going to worry about a tight end. I, I think uh, an edge. You're always looking at an edge. And if there's a mm -hmm. guy there, you're going to be looking at that. But those those are corner, edge, tackle, wide receiver. Those are the those are the four that I would say that's that's probably what you're going to see. I'd be interested to see what they do in regards to running back because I think that that's still I don't know that Chase Brown is necessarily your running back of the future, and I think that you're probably going to be at some point whether this year or next year wanting to get a young guy that you can lean into as as you're running back to the future i don't think i think zach moss is a bridge guy personally um i, I don't think he's going to be your running back to the future I, I think they're probably looking at zach moss honestly as kind of to fill that uh like samaj pirine type role um where you bring him in yeah. for blocking purposes They'll get one. It's it's weird because, like, I mean, my God, back in the old days, you draft these running backs early. Now it's – Yeah. It's – I mean – Fourth you, round, fifth round, yeah. I mean, now got, they're getting guys. Look at Isaiah Pacheco, for God's sakes. What was he, a six-round pick or something? I mean, you can end up with – Yeah, you can back. end up with – No, he's an undrafted free agent. Flourish. But – um you know, you 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 can find a guy if he fits what you you know you you got to get a little specific, but you don't have to draft one high. But I I I won't be shocked if they draft one, you know, in the first four rounds. I won't because I like you just said if it's if it's a guy they think can be their their dude in the future, 
And, you know, there's a lot of running backs who have come into the league who have been drafted down the road um, in the later rounds. Hell, there's even undrafted free agents who have done well at that position here recently. So you you just identify the guy and, and get him where you think you you can and, and, and get him for good value and, and go for it. And that's awesome. what the Bengals did with Chase Brown last year, really. Right, right. Um, I'm also looking at guard, um, as I don't know that – I still don't know who Cordell Wilson is. Is he yeah, a guy I who – I agree. Is he, is he a guy or is he the guy yeah, that you're looking sure. to replace? That's a good um, point. And then also nose tackle with DJ Reader leaving, uh, bringing in Sheldon Rankins. You did do that, but he's not a nose tackle. He's a three-tech. Um, so now he's rotating with B.J. Hill. You still don't have necessarily that nose tackle spot filled at this point. Yeah, and and they'll probably grab someone somewhere in that draft. And who knows? That could be a first round. Um, you never have right. enough of those guys is the thing. Yep. And so I, but this signing with Trent Brown offers them that kind of flexibility. And right. then you know, I I don't think that the tight end from Georgia is going to be there in the first round and make draft. But what if he is? Well, what if by some miracle? What would you do? Because that kid's pretty damn special. I don't, I don't know. It'd be tempting. It would be tempting, but I, I'd almost make the argument against it because I don't think you spend a first this 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 team as so so long as Zach Taylor is in charge. I don't think you spend a first round pick. I don't care how generational he is. Look at Kyle Pitts' situation as the most Correct. generational tight end. Correct ever in his draft. Um, but I don't want to end up with a, with a guy that we don't use. And I think that currently Jasicki fit, fits that role just fine. They've made it work with guys like Hayden Hurst. Um, I just don't think they utilize that position enough to spend, especially on a receiving tight end, to spend a first round pick on a Brock Bell. I think you trade back, truthfully. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I don't know what I do, um, and it depends on how highly they think of him. But as you said, for the most part, tight end has not been a key position in this scheme offensively. Um, in fact, it's been more of a blocking position for the most part. But uh, you know, the year Hayden Hurst had was 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 decent. Um, you know, that's all you're ever going to get out of that position with, with Cincinnati is decent. Yeah, decent. Right, right. And and if that's the case, you don't make that pick. But man, oh man, um, that could throw a monkey wrench into things if you're Cincinnati. I mean, you know, yeah, you're fun, fun to it, enjoy. Okay. So we get this guy, and then you got him and Chase. And if, if Higgins is going to leave after next year, I, I don't know. But then I don't know how much they can adjust their offense to do that. But I, I think uh, you can adjust your offense to do anything as long as you have a guy with the talent Burrow has back there. Sure. Um, moving off that subject, though, and on to baseball. Uh, the Reds are getting ever closer. I think we're under the two-week mark uh, before opening day, um, but ever, ever closer to that opening day and – the injuries are mounting up most recently. TJ Friedel, uh, Jake Fraley left last night's game. Uh, Lodolo still struggling. I don't. I, I know they didn't say anything about Frankie Montas, but he had a terrible outing. I'm hoping it's not due to an injury. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you what. You get to this. I to get to my Reds page here. Let's see. Yeah, Friedel, McLean with the shoulder now. Right, right. What the? Um, Friedel, McLean, Nick Martinez is nicked up. Alex Brandon Williamson. Young, so they had to bring in that other lefty reliever that they just signed because Alex Young's hurt. You know, Lodolo, I think, is coming back. Here's I don't understand this about this Lodolo. Brandon thing. Williamson is injured. Brandon Williamson's injured. Uh, Marte's on the you know eighty days, eighty game suspension. Um, I 
This is worst case scenario in spring training. Now China. they're extra careful in spring training with these injuries, right? Right. It, it's like you have a hangnail, you're out a week because they don't want to risk <laughs> anything. Seriously, they're they're not going to risk anything. And some of these guys may be okay if it's regular season, but um, this is a little concerning because you know they had all that depth coming into the season, and then. McLean gets injured. Marte's out 80 games. You know, Candelario, who they signed, and now maybe we understand why they signed him because they saw a, a, a light at the end of the tunnel and it was a train coming at him in the form of an 80 game suspension at third base. Um, right. Now that the, the depth is in, in center field, Friedel's not going to be ready for the start of the season. So you're looking at, at Benson, Fairchild, but does Bubba Thompson, is he the answer in center field? Is he that? I mean, <laughs> he may be. He's having a good spring. Well, Fairchild, I look, I wanted Fairchild gone. Oh, he's and having a monster was, spring. He, he is. I can't argue that at all. I, and I'm, I'm hoping, today. I, I hope that he just continues to be on fire. Totally good with that. Um, I, I thought he was odd man out when I looked at this roster. Uh, when spring training was starting, um, clearly not. There, there is certainly a spot as as things are as the dust is beginning to settle uh, for Stuart Fairchild. But he's not a guy you're going to rely on for the season. I mean, he's going to fill gaps, fill roles, and yeah. and they can probably get away with that. But this injury thing with them is. It's unbelievable. It's you look at the pitching, and it's like, oh, they got all these pitching options, and they do. But I mean, Hunter Green again today. It's like a one, two, three inning, and then blows up. One, two. He's got to get consistent. Either that, or he's got to go to the bullpen eventually. I mean, you can't have a starting pitcher, and and he had uh, Christ. He's he's striking out guys left and right. 17 and 12 innings this spring. He had a bunch today, but at the same time, he's got a bunch of walks. Um, he has got to get some consistency if he's going to continue to be a starting pitcher. You can have a good inning, a blow-up inning, a good inning, a blow-up. It doesn't do the team any good. Not with the way they're paying him, no. No. <laughs> yeah, and they gave him that big deal. Yeah. Uh, they gave him ace money. Essentially, he gave him ace money, and you know, they it's spring training, and Hunter is working on a pitch or two. But I, right. I'm I would like to be a little more encouraged a week out from opening day. Um, I'm still gonna say they're gonna be in the hunt and they're gonna be in the mix. I mean, they just got too much talent to just say, hey, based on this, these spring games, but. It, it does jar you a little when you see some of these numbers by the guys that they're banking on in that starting rotation. But I remember years ago, um, Aaron Harang had this horrific spring, and I talked to – it was David Ross um, who was catching. And I, <laughs> I talked to him late in spring training about Harang's spring – and, and what issues he thought that might pretend for the regular season. He's like, oh, no, I'm not worried. He's doing this. He's doing that. He'll be fine. So Harang goes out on opening day and has a great game, and David Ross was catching. So I go up to Ross, and I go, well, um, I don't know if you remember what we talked about a week ago, but he goes, oh, I remember. I was thinking about it during the game when, when Aaron was racking up. <laughs> I'm like, okay, thank you. I'm glad I'm glad I could be on your radar during the game asking a stupid question. <laughs> no worries, I was just concerned. I was concerned. I'm like, are you concerned at all with how he looked? In no, no, he's fine. He's on track. And I'll be damned if David Ross wasn't right, but uh, it was just funny. I said, yeah, I was thinking about you when that was going on. It's like, Jesus Christ. Oh my God! I'm glad I could be the butt of his jokes like everybody else's. 
Good old orangutan. So yeah, you don't. The thing is, you just don't put a whole lot. Of, Harang was a great guy. I love that guy. He was funny as he he was very reserved, funny man, very funny man, self deprecating. He was great. Um, but yeah, you just don't put a whole lot of stock in spring. The main thing is to get out unscathed and not all these injuries. And the Reds haven't been able to do that. I mean, I, I just hope these things, you know, get healed up. And by the end of April, they got their full squad, Friedel's back, and uh, everything's cooking along because they do have a lot of talent. Well, we'll find out here in the near future what this roster is going to shape out to be come opening day. Um, FC Cincinnati finally gets a win after being knocked out of CONCACAF. Yeah. Uh, they won 2-1 in their last Yep, match. got two goals, and I'm telling you, if they, if they can get two or three goals, they're money. They're money. Uh, they have another good year, I think. Third place put, now, it's early, but uh, they're in good shape. They got that win over New England. Um, that puts them currently at 2-2. Two and two. Um, breaking news, Xavier loses in the first round of the NIT to Georgia, 78-76. Um, hate, hate to see you go, but see. God, Georgia had struggled lately, too. Yep. Well, I really thought – I don't know what the number was in that game. I'm sure it was it was a tight number, um, but I thought Xavier might win that game. What number are you talking about? The spread. Um, the opening spread, I don't know if they'll still have it here or not, but we will see. Uh, one and a half was the spread. Yeah, I knew that would be tight. Um, and they played, they played in Georgia. Right. Right. They were down there. I, I still thought X might, uh, pull that thing out. But I, um, I'm kind of surprised when you look at that, uh, and, and maybe I'm dumb. But the, the NIT bracket and Seton Hall and, and Villanova had number one seeds. And wow, I thought that was kind of weird. Yeah, well, it's that, that tough you know, big East. So they were top heavy. They had two, three good teams. And UConn played terrific the other night down the stretch in that uh that that big East championship. They did uh, do that. I mean we we can say whatever about the Big East, but that team's legit. Yeah, and they're looking to try and get another another championship this season, so we'll see right. how that goes. Um, anything else you got for local? No, or... good. Oh, comment on friendly competition for eyeballs between you, Chance, and Papo. First of all, I love those guys. Never had a bad relationship with them. Both of them were great. And it was competition, though, back in the day. And you used to have someone log every story they did in their sports cast while I was up doing mine or, you know, or if it was Brew or whoever. And we would log the competition. And and by God, every night you wanted to beat them. And, and, and the number of stories and what you had in those stories and it's hard to explain it here, but it was a competition. You kept an eye on those guys, and you wanted to beat their ass every day, every night. And it didn't always happen that way. There were nights you got owned, and it, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot, and it's changed a lot since then. The whole dynamic and business has changed because there's so many eyeballs elsewhere now, but back before cable really took hold and the local news was still a big deal. Oh my God, it was a war. But but at no point did I ever have any bad experiences with those guys. We had a blast. Well, good to hear. Ass. Plenty of trips down memory lane in on this episode with, with yeah, George sorry here. About that. I got sidetracked on that whole San Francisco <laughs> Notre Dame thing, but I'm still mad about it. Just Clearly, make me I, remember that. Look, I'm, I'm hoping that you're going to be watching that game tomorrow night with a hatchet in your pocket, like on your belt. 
I just in case the, of the game. Oh well. I mean, and if you remember last year's NIT game, remember that like at home when it was crazy because like people who don't usually sit in the lower bowl are there, yeah. like this big party, and it was a nine o'clock game. It's going to be this, and I couldn't go because I was at work. Well, guess what? I'm going to be there tomorrow night. And then the I, party. I, my 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 season ticket guy. Didn't see the email. He says he didn't get it, so maybe he didn't get it. But he he had to get us general admission, so I don't know where the hell I'm going to sit. Is it is it Joey? It's not Joey. Is no, it? it's not Joey. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's my it's my boy Negative Phil. All Negative right. Phil's out of town, so he can't go to the game. But he's like my guy that's in charge of my football and basketball ticket hookup and negative Phil's out of town and negative Phil says he didn't get the email. I think negative Phil missed it. So now we got general admission because all the, all the other stuff sold out before negative Phil got his act together. <laughs> Love it. Well, thanks to all who joined us tonight here on yeah, the show. Thank you all. Enjoy the game tomorrow night. Bring home that win, George. Uh, as Cincinnati does take on San Francisco at 9 o'clock at Fifth Third Arena. Uh, but until next Tuesday, 9 o'clock, for George Vogel, I'm Aaron Smith, and we'll see you then. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, and thanks to Remington Tavern, 8892 Glendale, Milford Road, right. 45140, hey, daily happy hour, 3 to 7 p.m., $5 Woodford Wednesdays. Find them on Instagram and on Facebook. We'll see Thank you, you Remington Tavern, very much.